All right, so let's talk about our next story here. So we're going to, going to, we're going to get into why the Middle Ages ended. So last lecture, this is a quick review, of course, you should have just watched it. We had talked about the Middle Ages, kind of give you a very brief overview of the Middle Ages. I didn't go into tremendous detail like I do in my History 110 class, but it gives you a sense of what life was like, the feudal structure, the power of the church, how the government system worked, right, through feudalism. Um, and what we need to talk about is what happened to those Middle Ages, what happened to lords and vassals and knights and, you know, that whole structure of the Middle Ages. Why did it end after hundreds of years that gave birth to the modern world? And there are several reasons why the Middle Ages ended. Uh, but probably the most significant of all those reasons is this event known as the Black Death. And so what we're going to focus on is not quite the same deep detail in this as maybe we'd get in other lectures on the Black Death, because I'm not going to focus on every element of the Black Death or the bubonic plague. Instead, I want to focus on what happened with the Black Death that helped bring about the end of the Middle Ages. And I'll mention a couple other events as well that helped bring about the end of the Middle Ages as well. So that's the kind of the big objective you want to get out of this lecture today. So where do we start? Well, we start by looking at some numbers here. So let's look at our next slide. And these numbers are pretty dramatic, actually. So what I'm showing you here, obviously you want to get all these numbers down so you can pause and get them down. You can get them down as I'm talking in this case. Um, and these are years and population numbers. And what you see on the left are years and what you see on the right are population numbers in millions right so it's saying around 1200 AD there were about 50 million people who lived in Western Europe now I will say you can open up 10 different history books find 10 different sets of numbers on this but the pattern is going to be the same that you see the numbers going up 1250 1300 remember if you remember the Middle Ages I said goes from 476 the Middle Ages all the way until about circa 1400 right so that's why we have these dates 1300 about 80 million then you see 1350 about 50 million 1400 maybe about 40 million and again we don't know the exact numbers but we do see a dramatic decline in the population of western europe right in the mid 1300s and specifically 1347 and you know i always say you don't ever need to memorize exact dates in my class and you don't need to memorize 1347 the black death hit all of europe right um well it hit italy first i'll explain that and then all of europe um but you do need to know mid 1300s right and so this was devastating in terms of the sheer number of people that are going to be impacted by this and you know, it's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of if you look at the numbers and how many people die during the Black Death and you think, well, how, you know, it's just a disease could have that big of an impact. Put it in perspective of something like COVID, right? And if you think of COVID and you think of the numbers of people that were killed as a result of the COVID crisis that we went through compared to the population of the United States, what I'm about to tell you is going to give you some really amazing perspective. There were, what, over a half a million Americans killed by COVID, 500,000 people, over 500,000 people, basically all within a year, right? And if you do the math on that, 500,000 people out of a population of roughly 350 million people, right? So five, about 500,000, over 500,000 people died. But the population of the country is nearly, not quite, but nearly 350 million. It works out to less than point, it's something, you could do the math yourself on a calculator, but it works out to something like less than one, it's 0.005%, whatever it is. It's a, a percentage wise, it's less than a percentage point, right? It's a decimal of a percentage point. Compare that to the Black Death, which killed 30, 40, maybe 50%. So COVID didn't even kill 1.1% of the population. Imagine if we went through something that killed 1% of our population, what kind of impact that would have on society. So COVID, which took you know, a decimal of a percentage point, think of how it impacted us, how it impacted economics, obviously beyond the lives that were lost, right? But the economics, the, the shutdowns, the, the psychological impacts it had, 
the, the, the rise of depression and suicides that we saw as a result of the shutdown. You know, it, it, it was really a you know, hard event to us, for us to go through, and that was a decimal point. So I, I'm, I'm stressing this to give you an idea of what 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% can mean to, to a civilization. So it's not a surprise when you have these kind of numbers you're going to have, you know, obviously tremendous impacts on Western civilization. So I think that I hope gives you a little bit of perspective if you think about it that way. All right, so you get the numbers, big, huge drop. Now, a little bit more background on this. So you have some keywords, and again, you always want to get these keywords down. And just as a reminder, yes, you're going to write down the keywords, but then, you know, you can write them all down at once. You could pause, write them all down. But then you also want to remember that you, you want to write down the words again as they come up in my narrative. As I'm talking about it, you write them down again. So go ahead, pause. I'm going to go to a map here. Um, to talk about a first couple of these and then I'm going to kind of bring the keywords back up for you actually. Uh, so go ahead, you know, get them all down. I'm going to bring them up again another slide in, in, in just a couple minutes here. Okay. All right. So I'll give you a second to pause, we'll write down the words, and we will move on. All right. So here's a map. And I want to start with a little background in terms of how COVID arrived. I'm uh, sorry, how COVID, how the Black Death arrived. Um, into Western civilization. Um, ironically, it actually also arrived from the Eastern world. We think of, you know, COVID and we know it, you know, had its origins over in China and it was the Black Death that probably had its origins in the Eastern world as well. And the way it arrived is through primarily through trade. And so what you see on this map here, are all these dark, these purple lines, those are trade routes. And so one of the things that happened at the end of the Middle Ages is there was growing trade that was happening is in part because of the Crusades and other reasons people were moving east and west a lot more. And so there's a lot of movement and a lot of the trade that was coming from the Eastern world, you know, had on it a great were, were, were boats that carried on it grains of um, ships that carried grain. The grain then attracted the rats, and people think, oh, the rats caused the bubonic plague. Eh, not exactly. Um, it wasn't the rats. It was actually these little fleas on the rats that, that brought about the plague that made everybody sick. And the first place it arrives is in Italy, and it's not a surprise it hits in terms of Western civilization, Western Europe. It hits Italy first, and it makes sense it hits Italy first, again, around 1347, uh, because Italy is jutting out in the Mediterranean Sea geographically. Of course, it's easy to navigate and trade through. But then, because of the trade routes, it spreads, and it spreads very quickly. 1347, it hits Italy. By 1349, 1350, all of Western Europe has been impacted. And I do want you to pay attention, it is Western Europe. Eastern Europe here, you can see, is more in the gray. It doesn't really get impacted nearly as much. And so it's more the Western part of Europe that's gonna be impacted by the Black Death, more than the Eastern part of Europe. Uh, that is actually a little bit gonna be somewhat important in another lecture when we talk about the different monarchies that are gonna develop in modern Western civilization. So you have the plague spreading. It's devastating. Um, I want to show you one more picture here. I said it was from uh, the fleas, right? And so this is actually an image of a flea, you know, just a flea, that probably was on the rats, which was on the ships, which, of course, eventually made its way to, to coming in and causing the bubonic plague. Uh, and here are the words again. So, you know, we have Italy there. That's the kind of the first word I put up there. And then I can kind of run through the rest of this stuff talking about the Black Death. We these keywords up for you. And then I'm going to uh, bring up the map again and talk about the every, everything associated with it. So we talked about where it came from, right? So it comes from the Eastern world. It hits Italy, spreads. The next thing I want to talk about is, you know, their ideas of what caused the plague. And, you know, we know how it arrived. But their idea of medicines back then were not very good. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples here, a couple of these key terms, uh, key words that we have um, that are associated with what they thought caused the plague. So, for example, comets. They thought comets caused the plague, believe it or not, because they, if you ever see a comet at night, it's very bright. And the tail of the comet they would see and they would think the tail of the comet was dripping things down that was making everybody sick. So they thought comets caused the black death. Um, earthquakes. 
Uh, they thought the ground would shake and earthquake would happen. And from the underworld, you know, would spew things out that made everybody sick. Of course, that was ridiculous as well. They looked for people to blame and not a surprise of one scapegoat throughout history. And, you know, sadly, it happens over and over again. They blamed the Jews. They said, well, you know, somebody's poisoning the water. It must be the Jewish people. And unfortunately, if any of you have taken History 110 with me before, you know this is obviously or the History of the Middle East class I teach. Um, you, you know this is an unfortunate theme in history that you know people constantly target the Jewish people. And so there were these falsehoods spread that the Jews were responsible. And in fact, in the city of Strasbourg, um, there were thousands of Jews massacred the next year, 1348 were massacred uh, for causing, quote unquote, causing the plague. Of course, they had nothing to do with it. So I'm mentioning these things to show you they really had no idea. They didn't have a good, solid idea of what caused the bubonic plague. They were just kind of guessing with things at this time period. The symptoms, um, so I'm just give you a few things. So that's in terms of what they thought caused the plague. The symptoms are pretty bad, you know, when you get the bubonic plague, it usually takes several days for you to die, but it's pretty nasty, apparently. Uh, you would start to feel run down. Oftentimes you would sneeze a lot. And, you know, today when somebody sneezes, you say, bless you. Um, and we believe that's actually from the bubonic plague. At least that's one theory. There's some other ideas of that, uh, that, you know, because what happens next and you'd be blessed. Very often you would get these um, you'd start to develop a fever and then you kind of the sign is often these kind of blood boils that would appear on your body like the size of golf balls or even a little larger and these blood boils would would blister and eventually pop and as they popped and turned black hence the term black death uh, that your body would basically be turning black inside out you'd be disintegrating essentially uh, you would vomit a lot you'd have very high fevers it would as a nasty way to go um, and, and then it would kill you. So um, one thing interesting is people can still get the bubonic plague today. And people do every so often around the summertime. You might hear stories of, of somebody catching the bubonic plague and all of that. Uh, it's usually not carried on rats. Uh, sometimes it's carried on other things like squirrels. People play with the squirrels. Don't play with the squirrels. Squirrels going to kill you. Um, and there was one rare case of a dog ca carrying it uh, to human beings. Uh, but it, it's rare and you go, well, if it's still around, why doesn't everybody die from it like back then? Well, a couple reasons. One is we believe a lot of people have some sort of immunity to it, immunity to it. Um, and, you know, as they develop that immunity, then obviously they're not going to be impacted once they, you know, they, they develop who survived had that immunity, I should say. And then they pass that on to us over the generation. So we're a bit more immune. Um some theories about blood types and all these different ideas uh, that may have had something to do with it, with why, you know, more people back then got it than today. Um, so there are different theories about that. The other thing, of course, is when somebody gets it today, unless you're a moron, if you start seeing blood boils appear on your body, you're going to go to the doctor and you're going to get it treated. And you can't, if you get it treated, you're going to be okay. But if you're not immune to it and you get it, you're going to have a problem. Uh, so anyway, so those, those are some symptoms. They tried to cure the plague, and the way they tried to cure the plague was a bit looney toony. Um, you know, they tried wearing amulets to ward off evil spirits. You can imagine if they really didn't have a good idea of what caused the plague, they're not going to have a good idea of how to cure it. So wearing amulets to ward off evil spirits, bloodletting, cutting you open, letting you bleed to death, uh, letting you, bleeding you out, hoping it will get the black death out, but all that does is kill you faster. Uh, in Italy, they had an interesting idea. Uh, this term here, quadriginta, what does that mean? It means when a ship arrived to Italy, this after the Black Authority spread, they said everybody on the ship had to stay on the ship for a period of 40 days, quadriginta. After that 40-day period, then they can go on to the mainland if they don't have any, any signs of the symptoms of the disease. Uh, of course, we get a word from that, and the obvious word we get from that is quarantine. Uh, so that was a good idea, but a little bit too little, a little bit too late. Uh, so they, they really don't know what's causing it very well, and so their solutions aren't very good either. And so they resorted to a lot of these kind of crazy things. And again, you know, if you think of COVID as well, you know, you think, oh, people wouldn't react that way. Um, you know, people, obviously, we took precautions and people were wearing masks and this and that. 
Well, I'm sure you've all seen people also taking it to a place where they were, people were behaving irrationally. You were people were wearing masks in their cars, driving by themselves. I'm sure some of you remember that. Maybe even some people did it, and it's it's natural because it's how we react psychologically to these things. And so there's this whole thing about the psychological impacts uh, of something like a, a disease that kills a lot of people. So it, it's fascinating. I'm sure years from now people will kind of look back at COVID and black death and try to compare from a psychological standpoint how people behave. Uh, there's one more key term here, Great Schism, and get to that as we go on in our maps here and keep talking. So those are a few things right off. So we know the causes or what they thought were the causes. Uh, we know how what the symptoms, we know how they tried to treat it, but what we really want to focus on here is going to be the impacts of the Black Death, especially how the Black Death ends the Middle Ages. That's the key thing I really want to focus on. So here's just our map again. Um, here's the city of Strasbourg that I mentioned of where that Matt Jewish massacre takes place. Um, and then I want to kind of explain what brings an end to the Middle Ages. How does this Black Death end the Middle Ages and bring us to this more modern world? And so I'm going to go to this chart again. So here's our chart again. And I used this last lecture a bit, and if you remember the last lecture, I didn't put everything up, but we had the church at the very top, and then we had all these other groups. And you're going to see the bubonic plague, the Black Death, changes the power structure dramatically. And I'm going to explain to you why, by the time we get to 1500, the kings and all these other groups that weren't as strong surpassed the church for power and influence. So I'm going to mention several points here. You want to this is the most important slide, I think, in this whole lecture. So you want to get all these points down, all these ideas down. If you need to go back and listen to this part again, do listen to this part again, because this is what you need to really understand about this lecture. So let's walk you through step by step. Why would the Black Death change in the Middle Ages and bring about the modern world? All right, let's talk about the church first. Does the power of the church go up or down as a result of the Black Death? Well, as you can see on my graph here, it's going to go down. Why? It's the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages are the age of faith. People go to the church, say, church, why is everyone dying? And the church goes, oh, they can't explain it. So the church is not able to explain to people why everyone's dying. Church people are dying along with everybody else. So what in the Middle Ages, people looked at the church as this strong entity now doesn't have answers. Now, that by itself is not enough to demolish all the power of the church. It was kind of a perfect storm for the church, a perfect negative storm for the church at the time. Because at the same time the Black Death was happening, there were a couple other things hitting the church as well. One of the other terms I gave you there was Great Schism. What's the Great Schism? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but you definitely want to know the term. The Great Schism was when you actually had a big conflict within the Catholic Church. And there was disagreements on who should be the Pope. And at one point you had two Popes, actually three Popes even at the same time, but two is, was enough to create a Schism. A Schism means a big split. So there was this great schism, a big, big split in the church where the church leaders couldn't agree who should be the pope. And so here half of Europe is dying and the church leadership is bickering on who should be the pope. This was happening at the same time as the Black Death. So that makes the church look weak as well. So the Black Death, they can't explain it. You have the great schism, which, which hurts the church. There was also a lot of corruption in the church. You know, in the Middle Ages, I said, the church had a lot of power. Well, absolute power corrupts absolutely, whatever it is, um, whether it's secular or non or religious, it doesn't matter. If you give a government a lot of power, they get corrupted. If you give uh, big tech a lot of power, they get corrupted. If you give church a lot of power, they get corrupted. Pa absolute power corrupts it absolutely. And so that was happening as well. So there was corruption issues, there was the Great Schism, and then there was the Black Death all combined, definitely hurt the power of the church. Another group that was impacted was serfs. Now, you could see in the last graph in the previous lecture, I used the word serfs. Down here, I put the word peasants. I, I know it's small. I hope you could see that. But if you can't see that down on the bottom, it says peasants. And the reason I put in peasants instead of serfs is because one of the things the Black Death is going to do, and this is a, another key point you want to get down, it's going to end serfdom. Why? Let's walk you through this. Serfs 
their job was to work the land. The Black Death kills 30, 40, 50 percent of the population. That means 90 percent of the people were those workers. Half of them died. What happens to the half that are still alive? Well, this is basic economics 101. If you have less workers, they're worth more, right? And so if you have less people, think of any job. What will get you paid more in life? Have a skill that less people that can do that is needed, right? So if you are really, really good at something that's needed in society and very few people can do it, jackpot, you're going to be valuable. Um, if you have a really good skill, but nobody needs it, yeah, you're not going to be very valuable, right? So you need workers, you need people to farm the land, but all of a sudden you don't have enough of them. And so if, if what this does is these nobles before who were relying on serfs to work their land, now they don't have that anymore. And you get these stories actually of, of um, nobles after the Black Death trying to work their own land. They don't know how to farm. They don't know how to work a, a, a plow and all of that stuff and know how to do that. And so you get actually these uprisings. You get like peasant uprisings and it changes the very nature of the Middle Ages in the sense that you, you no longer have people tied to the land working. If you're a noble, you're going to have to pay somebody some money to work the fields. Now, I don't want you to think that all of a sudden the, they get democracy and they have, you know, all this influence and strength. They're still at the very bottom of my list here. You see in terms of power structure, they still have less influence than everybody else, but it does end serfdom. And by doing that, it also hurts the nobles a little bit because the nobles no longer have that free market. Um, so that's what's happening. That's how the Black Death is changing things. There was another thing, if you want to jot this down, may not be a bad idea, something called the Hundred Years' War uh, that happened at the end of the Middle Ages at the same time as the Black Death. And that was significant because the Hundred Years' War introduced things like gunpowder. And in the Middle Ages, you had knights on horses and swords. Well, you know, a sword is really cool, but when somebody's got a cannon, you know, what's the old saying, never take a, a, a knife to a gunfight. And so this idea of having a, a knight on a horse with a sword, it's not going to work anymore. And so, you know, what kings begin to do is kings begin to realize, I don't have to, 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 to you know, give my land, my fiefs to, to these nobles to fight. I can hire a few of these peasants again, give them some money, and they could become my army. So kings are starting to use armies again. And so these, these events, like the Black Death, but then other things like the Great Schism and Hundred Years' War, they're changing the structure of society. Um, the merchants, the merchants become more important because you're going to have more cities developing. I'm going to kind of cover that in a bit more in the next lecture um, of how cities and new economics comes into play. And so this is what the Black Death is doing and these other events as well. They're, they're taking down the power of, of the, the church a lot. Uh, they're, they're giving the, the, the nobles, their nobles are losing their land. King, or not nobles aren't losing their land, I should say. Nobles are losing their ability to um, uh, have cheap labor or free labor and serve them. Uh, and, and so all of this changes and we go from the age of faith in the Middle Ages to the age of kings as we move into the modern world. And so I'm hoping all that is clear. That's kind of a little bit more of the mental gymnastics that you have to make sure you understand. Uh, so if you need to kind of listen to all that again and kind of get the idea of why, because it's not enough to say, well, the Black Death ended the Middle Ages. Why, right? Why did the power change? Why did the church lose influence? Why did the kings gain influence? Right, that's, that's the key thing I really want you to be able to get out of this lecture and, and understanding it. Um, so I hope all that's clear. Um, obviously, as always, as you're listening to this, if anything's still not clear after, as you watch the lecture, you know, send me an email, let me know. I'll be happy to walk it through with you. I'm always happy to meet with students one-on-one -on -one to, to kind of help you figure things out if anything's not 100% clear. Uh, one other little fun thing, or I don't know if it's a fun thing or not, but interesting, that I always like to throw in on the Black Death, um, some one cultural item. Uh, you may, you've all heard this probably when you're kids. Uh, it, ring around the rosies, pocket full of posies, ashes to ashes, we all fall down. 
uh, many people aren't aware, but it probably comes from the Black Death. Maybe not necessarily the 1347 version, because actually the bubonic plague hits multiple times, probably from a later version. But, you know, if little kids sing it, it's a little bit morbid. Ring around the rosies, pocket full of posies, ashes to ashes, we all fall down. The ring around the rosies are the blood boils, you know, that appear on your body, red, rosies. Pocket full of posies, the smell from all the dead bodies, people would would walk around with masks and they would stuff their masks with these flowers uh, to hide the stench of all the dead bodies. Ashes to ashes, I've heard it could be like the achoo achoo sneezing sound or the burning of the bodies for different theories on that. And then we all find, fall down, we all die. Uh, so that's, that's that nursery rhyme. And actually a lot of nursery rhymes are really based on uh, death. You know, people think, oh, these are so cute. Like, uh, well, what's another one? Um, Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch a bale of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown. Jack's dead. His crown is, his, you know, his head, right? And Joe came tumbling after. Uh, and then there's Rock My Baby on the Treetop. I, I don't know why you would sing that to your baby, but I, if you listen to the lyrics on that carefully, the baby dies at the end. It's like, oh, shh, don't do that. All right. So anyways, uh, a few little fun things to end with. Uh, so... That's mainly what I want you to get out of this lecture, understanding and just a few characteristics of the Black Death, really focusing on why the Black Death, along with these couple other events like the Great Schism and Hundred Years' War, helps end the Middle Ages. The next lecture is going to focus on the new modern world, right? We're going to talk about the new characteristics of the modern world, how things are, are so different in the modern world compared to the Middle Ages, and how many of the things in the early modern world are still with us today, which is interesting. And then from there, we're going to go on and really get into some specific details on these kings, on these monarchs, something I don't do. If any of you did take History 110, History 110, I don't really get into a lot of detail of these modern monarchs. In History 111, we get into a lot of detail on these monarchs, and we talk about absolute monarchs and constitutional monarchs and why they're different and, and get into some more details about these specific rulers. All right. Hope all that's good. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.